good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick Brown. I am the Deputy Executive Director with an organization called Learning Forward, which is based in Dallas, Texas, and I'll talk a little bit more about the work that we do in just a sec. But I want to welcome you to this exciting discussion on innovative professional learning and what are some of the strategies that we're seeing across the country uh, that give us hope and promise that there are new ways of thinking about how we support the learning of the adults those who are so uh, responsible for supporting, of course, the learning of their children. And so I have with me uh, four folks who are working with some leading other national organizations uh, that are working with their systems to help them think about innovative forms of professional learning. I'm gonna let my panel members introduce themselves in just a sec. But before we go into those introductions and before we even begin our conversation, I have a question for the audience. And that is, we're talking about professional learning. And when we utter those words, different images come into your heads. Mm -hmm. Different form or different definitions probably pop into your minds. And so I'm gonna actually start by asking the audience a question, and that is, when you hear the word professional learning or professional development, how do you define that? What does that mean to you? Because before we can even start the discussion and introduce our panel, I think we have to have some common definition that we're working from. And so I'm going to ask the audience, just someone, if you'd lift your hand. There you go. Gentleman in the front, what's your name, please? Ron White. Ron, Ron White. Tell us your definition of professional learning. Well, my, my comment is it's an oxymoron. So the comment is professional <laughs> learning an is an oxymoron. <laughs> please tell us why. Gotcha. And it's that so just for the, uh, because we're being recorded, I'll repeat things as we're hearing them. Part of the concern was it's not as professional as it could be, perhaps not as much learning as we'd like to see, and it's underfunded in, in your particular state. And, and it's absolutely, it's so crucial. But yet very important. So what we're hearing are is just some concerns that it's, it's really professional learning is something that we deem to be really important, uh, but it's something that's not getting the attention that perhaps it deserves. And so I appreciate, Ron, appreciate those comments, and those are coming out of Utah. So I want to go back to then how do we define it? What do we mean? It, and tell us who you are, please. My name is Jean Tower. I'm from um, Massachusetts in K-12 education. Jean from Massachusetts. Thank you. So professional learning, anything that advances the knowledge and practice of teachers to advance their instruction and their teaching and learning back in their classrooms. Yes. All right, thank you so much. And we'll do one more definition. Yes. Ken from Rhode Island, thank you. So teacher pathways align to student pathways work. Yep. And that actually will be part of the discussion we have this morning, which is we heard a lot just in the last session uh, about how we think about learning for students. And how can we take what we heard from this morning and over the course of these days that we've been here and apply it to adults? So I appreciate the audience uh, giving us some insights into their definitions of professional learning. The first member of our panel, uh, Rachel, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then if you would give us your definition of professional okay. learning. I'm Rachel Langenhorst. I come from the upper northwest corner of Iowa, uh, a school district called Rock Valley. I am a K-12 technology integrationist and instructional coach. Um, for me, professional development, it used to be kind of that, that joke, that cartoon, that the, that you hope you die during professional development because the transition between <laughs> life and death would be so subtle. Um, and that really used to be the case. I mean, it was terrible. Um, we actually have done some very innovative things in our district um, with regards to professional development. And I think the key word here is that we have individualized 
development of our instructors in the capacity that they need, in the content area they need, and to meet them in the moment for the types of things that they need at that time. Got it. So you're introducing the concept of how do we individualize it for teachers, make it job embedded, right. to connect it to their practice. One size fits all no longer works. Got it. Mm -hmm. Wow, so I hope I'm never in the kind of professional learning that you described in the front end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Babak, tell us about uh, your work and your definition. Sure, so I'm Babak Mostagimi. I'm the Executive Director of Innovation and Program Learning in Gwinnett County Public Schools. Uh, we're located just north of Atlanta, 180,000 students, so a pretty large system. Um, a very sort of professional, well-oiled machine-like uh, system. Um, and for, for us, professional learning, it kind of gets to the core of education, right? Which is a two-pronged two piece of both molding practice and instruction, but also bringing forth from within the teachers the solutions that are already there. Um, so we've been partnering with IDEO and the, and the Teachers Guild uh, on figuring out how to integrate design thinking um, into teacher practice. Nice. Nice. So, and for those of you who have not been to Gwinnett, just such an innovative district. All the districts up here are extremely innovative, uh, but really looking forward to hearing more from uh, the two of you so far. You. Crystal, tell us about your district, your work, and your definition. I work for Juap School District. It's a central Utah, small rural district, mm -hmm. about 2,500 students. And within that space, um, I'd like to speak a little about just professional development. Yeah. I take issue with the word development because Thank I'm you. saying that teachers are coming to me not ready to engage and I don't think that's true. So I'll focus on the word learning, um, mm -hmm. professional learning, mm -hmm. and I believe that can be anything that helps teachers know more, be, um, be more, and really just supporting them on their journeys would be part of the heart of what I do. Nice. So there might be some competition for the smallest district between the one that you described <laughs> right. in uh, Utah and <laughs> Iowa. I love your point about development. Uh, one of the things that we've done uh, at Learning Forward is we have been trying to change that conversation, the paradigm, to professional development almost feels like something that happens to you. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> things are happening, you know, right. being, things oh, are being yeah. thrown at you, we're going mm -hmm. off-site, we're doing these things that are disconnected from our actual practice mm -hmm. versus learning where I'm an actively engaged partner in my own learning. Uh, and so that's just another twist uh, on the differences between the two. But thank you. Jessica, coming out of Chicago. So we're going from smallest to some of the largest uh, schools. Tell One us about. Up, yeah. um, good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Jessica Kurtz. I'm the assistant principal at uh, Talcott Fine Arts and Museum Academy. Um, and so um, thinking a little bit about professional learning, both uh, myself as a learner and then also defining that and supporting um, educators in their role. I, I agree a lot with Crystal. I think uh, we're doing a lot of really great things around uh, learner-led um, initiatives for students and making sure that their interests and their talents and skills are already captured in what it is that we're co-designing. And it would be um, a great tragedy to miss that opportunity with, with our teachers as well. So just thinking about that co-design phase and making sure that everyone's part of both the process and the end result. Nice. And so we had Arnie Duncan this morning in the session talking about the work he did in Chicago. And there's, Chicago is showing so many improvements lately as a district. And it's been interesting uh, as the rest of the country watches some of the work that's happened in Chicago. So I know we'll talk a little bit more about that. Some, some might say that professional learning has been under assault uh, over the past mm -hmm. year. And you know, there, there's a question about the impact that it can have. Uh, people are looking for documentation that the investment in professional learning is actually making a difference, not just in terms of teacher practice and leader practice, but also results for students. Right. And so part of what we're going to talk through this morning is how are these innovative programs that we're going to hear, how are they demonstrating an impact uh, in the systems that they are uh, and where they're housed? This, uh, you know, there's been the threat of the loss of Title II, <coughs> Title II funding uh, to support professional learning. Uh, many organizations, Learning Forward being one of them, have been fighting to retain that funding. But even in that fight, one of the things that we asked districts to do is tell us your stories about how those dollars, which resulted in whatever professional lear learning programs were in play, actually changed practice. And educators at times struggle making those connections. So when we hear from our panel today, panelists today, we're going to try to talk through a lot of those connections. And then the final point, and you made this, uh, People dread bad professional <laughs> learning. So just how many people in the audience are educators who have experienced 
bad professional learner. Okay, so the looks on their faces, I can see them all. <laughs> There's some like, for, like, I could tell people are having flashbacks to some of their, <laughs> to some of their words. Uh, so if we know that we can do a better job, I guess one of the first questions for the panelists, and you tell me who wants to jump on this first, what problem are we trying to solve with the kind of professional learning that your programs are looking to support? And we'll talk about the programs in more depth in just a second, but what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Who wants to? I can, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Krista. Um, I think our professional learning system was not aligned to the learning we wanted our students to do. So our teachers didn't have any sort of model mm -hmm. for the type of teaching they wanted to be engaged in. They never experienced it as students. And that was really a problem that we sought Got to it. kind of explore. Nice. Rachel, you want to? Yeah, for us, you know, really the, the biggest issue was the fact that we are rural. We have departments of one teacher. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of collaboration can you have when there's not even another human in the building that teaches the same content? Right. So we really needed to be able to um, spread our wings a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, reach out beyond the school. We also don't have the kind of budget where we can bring in you know, people that are you know, charging thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to cover a department of one. So it also just didn't yeah. make any sense. So a lot of what we are doing is making sure that we can custom tailor uh, our professional learning so that all of our teachers feel that what they're getting is meant for them. Mm -hmm. And we take what they honor, what they need, and then make that for them. Nice. Yeah, so being a department of one uh, mm -hmm. can certainly be a challenge. And I know there are lots, so innovations to support rural educators is becoming yeah. something, yes. many of whom have been largely ignored, mm -hmm. I will say, by a lot of the funders. Uh, because, the, and we understand why the dollars are going to where they are. But the real uh, story and the real context is something that's really important. Others, what would you say are the problems, uh, Jessica Babek? What are the, what are you trying to solve with your professional learning? Sure. So, so for us, we really fundamentally believe that students are going to be the problem solvers of tomorrow. And if we want them to be the problems of problem solvers of tomorrow, then our teachers need to be the designers of that mm -hmm. learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't think that comes from a central authority telling everyone exactly how to do the work in the classroom. We think the teachers have that knowledge and ability already. Mm -hmm. um, and with the appropriate training, we can bring that out of them and like reignite that passion mm -hmm. to build those problems for problem solvers for tomorrow. So that's really our, our we have this big future focus. Uh, and our, our work with the Teachers Guild has really supported us in, in making that happen. Nice. Great. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, um, on the other end of things, we have uh, more than enough resources at our fingertips. There are about six schools within a half mile radius of me. So certainly in geographics, I could very easily reach out to someone, but that yeah. doesn't mean that our work is necessarily um, aligned or at the same pace. And I think that's the same thing we ask of students is to meet them where they are and making sure that the professional learning meets the adult where they are. So I think our problem wasn't so much of a problem, but more just an adaptation or an adjustment um, to where every single adult learner is at their juncture in time. Got it. So in a second, we're going to hear each of your innovations and, and, and talk about the partner, talk about some of the cost and some of the challenges that you faced as you were working through these innovations. But before we go to that, uh, to those descriptions, I'm curious, is there another problem that we're trying to solve with professional learning that wasn't mentioned here that someone in the audience is thinking, well, here's a problem that we're trying to solve, and I would love to hear that problem because it might inform some of what they say. So what's another problem? We need to think about professional learning beyond just teachers, but we need to think about professional learning for school leaders. Mm -hmm. So professional learning not just for teachers, but also for school leaders who create the course conditions for teaching. So we're talking about what does it look like and how do we support leaders developing growth in their competencies, mm -hmm. not just going through a list, but just okay, really right. having a, a clear picture in their mind of what leadership, effective leadership practice looks like. Right, and yep. what, what it looks like and what it sounds like, and then how we give those leaders feedback so that they can grow and support mm -hmm. the professional development for, for the teachers, understanding the teachers' needs. Right, so you know, what's interesting along that point is so we know, our research tells us, the number one school-related factor that contributes to how well our students do, of course, is the effectiveness of the classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. So that's undisputed. But we also know that number two 
is the effectiveness of the leader. Mm -hmm. So how do we support the leader's growth in creating the kind of conditions where these kind of innovations can thrive and effective, con effective teaching and learning can happen at scale? Let's take one more problem that we're trying to solve. Yes, please. Uh, trying to first qualify and then figure out how to quantify the tremendous power of informal uh, teacher mm -hmm. learning experiences. Yes. So how do we qualify and quantify the informal learning experiences? Mm -hmm. There was a survey done uh, several years back, uh, and I can't remember the national organization. I think I just put it out of my brain. And they were trying to make the point that uh, when we ask teachers across the country, what kinds of experiences helped really change your practice? Uh, and they listed all these things in the survey results. Way down at number six or seven, I think it was, was effective pro mm -hmm. or professional learning. And the survey designers were trying to make the point that look at how low professional learning is. It's not making a difference at all. Higher up on the scale were things like having a collaborative conversation with my colleagues around mm -hmm. our practice, mm -hmm. being coached and supported with my practice. All of those things we would also call, we would call professional learning and could be part of a design. And you know, we'll hear perhaps from Georgia, which has quantified that in a bit so that those kind of learning experiences can actually count towards relicensure and recertification. So I think that's a great point. So let's start to hear from our folks about some of the innovations. Uh, Krista, I'm gonna look to you first. Okay. Tell us about the yeah. innovation, tell us about the partner and all those things that we talked about earlier. Juab School District uses micro-credentials as one of our options for professional learning. And we are with Digital Promise, powered by Bloomboard. Those are the credentials that we use. And the idea behind these speaks to some of what you're saying in the audience this idea of maybe more informal learning opportunities that we're recognizing. Um, so the idea is that a teacher engages in the research, learns about this discrete skill maybe, mm -hmm. then they put it into practice in the classroom, and they document it with artifacts of their learning and reflect on that learning. And when it's all said and done, they get a badge. Mm -hmm. um, I was a Girl Scout for 13 years. Um, I'm going to say that right now. And so badging does appeal to me, but I also see what it does for my teachers. They, you know, there's a reason it's called a badge of pride. They, they get to now show and share these skills with other teachers and start this network of conversations. Um, it's been a really powerful thing for us. How are those badges recognized? Like, what, what, what does it mean? So in the Girl yeah. Scout network across the country, mm -hmm. anyone will see that badge and say, oh, you've, done, you've got this skill. How do these badges translate uh, in a similar way in your district? Yeah, so within our district, one of the things that sets us apart, a lot of places are exploring micro-credentials. Mm -hmm. We have put micro-credentials into policy within our district. So we are supporting teachers with a stipend when they've earned an individual credential. And teachers can also curate their own stack, their own pathway of learning to um, earn what's called the teacher leader pathway. Mm -hmm. And I think that recognition, it absolutely is gaining momentum because not only are they getting the learning, they're getting this you know, shareable digital badge, mm -hmm. but we are celebrating that learning in a really public way. Nice. So your partner in this is Digital Promise? Yes. Is there anyone from Digital Promise in the room? Hands somewhere, Digital Promise? I thought we had, no? <laughs> I'm with, okay. um, We're in the League of Innovative Schools with Digital Promise, Got and it. that has been really pivotal for us. And the only reason I was looking for perhaps a show of hands, because there might be someone who has questions yeah. about it. Yeah, so perhaps some of the other partners might be in the room. <laughs> Any, what plug would you put out there for Digital Promise as a partner in this work? Digital Promise has supported us every step of the way. We started with early exploration. They supported us in a pilot. We wanted to know that we were making the right choice as we move forward, mm -hmm. and they gave us all of the structure to go forward with confidence. Um, and just that, I feel completely supported that any of my questions can be answered as I move forward. Nice. So, Babak, you heard what, we, what we're hearing from Utah. Yeah. What's, what's your story uh, there in Gwinnett? Sure, so Gwinnett County Public Schools is a really big district, right, um, which affords new and different opportunities. We got the opportunity to partner with um, the Teachers Guild, which is based out of IDEO, um, on a design thinking pilot partnership this year. 
uh, which has been tremendous for our organization. And essentially what the partnership does is it takes about 75 teachers from four schools through uh, the design thinking process where in the, the fall they go through the empathy and the, and the ideate phases and then in the spring they're, they're building out designs, they're testing and iterating right. ideas uh, and then figuring out how to scale or share those ideas. Um, and all of it comes back to the sort of basic premise that educators are the innovators that education mm -hmm. has been waiting for, right? Yeah. Like teachers are those people. Um, they're, they're professionals with a lot of ideas and expertise and we just don't tap into that very often. Um, and so, so for us, the process really um, starts with a, a design question. Um, and so, so for us, uh, our teachers developed our design question with support of, of the Teachers Guild. Um, and it ended up being, uh, how might we fundamentally redesign the student's learning experiment, experience? Um, it, and and it, you know, it had a, a little extra piece to it as well. But um, at, at the core, teachers are trying to see what can we do differently as teachers um, in our own classrooms, but then across classrooms, how can we, to the uh, administrator's comment earlier, how do we get our administrators on board? And really the, the full function of, of our partnership has been one where we've really been pushed as a district, I think in a positive way, mm -hmm. to rethink how we integrate teacher ideas, to rethink all the structures and systems around why things go the way they do now. Uh, and to make sure that we can build in that design experience so that we can make sure that our students, you know, get those skills again uh, to be the problem solvers of tomorrow. So can you give us an example of an idea that started in that process and then where that idea is now? Sure, so I'll actually give, a, give an example of an idea that didn't work, because I think That's it's great. one of the big things that we're, we're really pushing is, is learning from failure, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the faster you can fail, the better off you are, right? A lot of people in here are probably from ed tech. We don't do that in the education space, right? Um, but we also, we, we'll make big bets, right? Uh, and assume they're gonna work. So instead, with the teachers go support, we've learned how to take really, really small tests of ideas. Mm -hmm. So we had one team of teachers who um, believed that in their school, they had like a, essentially a d diversity awareness problem. Mm -hmm. They're like, our students just like don't know each other and things like that. And just for reference, our district is remarkably diverse. We have like 20 something percent white students, about 30% African-American, 30% Latino, uh, about 10% Asian, and which is great. Yeah. It's one of our strongest pieces in Gwinnett County. Um, and so they started off with just like a, a little survey and found out actually the diversity challenge or not knowing about other people and other kids wasn't a student problem, but it was a teacher problem. Um, and that fundamentally changed the solution. Like it went from we're going to have all these like culture fairs and things like that to, oh, okay, we need to kind of look in, inwards and, and look at what our own practice. Um, but then alongside that, we have a lot of people looking at flexible scheduling, looking at different models for um, integrating technology uh, in a seamless ma manner in the classroom. And instead of it being like what reform typically does, which is top-down solutions imposed upon teachers, mm -hmm. these are teacher-developed solutions mm -hmm. that then they pull on the capacity of the district to support. Nice, thank you, appreciate that example. So Jessica, you're hearing this, you're hearing from small, you're hearing from large districts. You're, what's in Chicago? Your partner's LEAP. Yes, LEAP Innovation. And so mm -hmm. tell us about that uh, initiative and tell us what kind of a difference it's making. Sure. Um, so LEAP Innovations is housed in Chicago um, and they have a few different opportunities to, to work um, alongside them and Talcott works uh, through the Pilot Network, which is a, a truly opt-in program for educators, um, including administrators. So coming back to that idea of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, adult learning for, for leaders and for teachers um, to opt in and go through an 18-month curation process. Um, so it has kind of that design thinking, uh, you know, alignment, I think, that, that uh, teachers Teachers really seem to celebrate and, and benefit from, um, but also that idea of um, using technology in a way to facilitate the learning, not as the learning, but as a, as a partner in the creativity that comes from, from the human capacity on a team. So uh, Talcott has uh, a team of seven teachers and then uh, myself and the principal. So we've been going to uh, monthly PDs with them, working alongside around uh, personalized learning and really building our understanding of that. Um, and I'm the first to tell you that as a classroom teacher, I would not have known about all the strategies that, that my teachers have at their disposal. And I need to learn about that in order to really support them in their growth. So uh, LEAP then has the, the supplemental support where they have a coach come out to our school. So I work with the coach, the coach works with the teachers, and then there's a full 
cycle of turnaround with feedback with students. So it's been a really good opportunity to get perspective all along the way um, around what is and isn't working in small, tangible ways. Um, mm -hmm. And that idea of fast failure and, and uh, having that culture around with, with the coach, you know, invite me a day, invite me a day to a class where you think you might fail. It's a good feeling when people still actually invite you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we're doing something right around, around learning and, and LEAP cultivates that from day one. So I think that, um, that acceptance and that understanding and that open door communication has made it really successful so far. So that, I mean, that could be a real culture shift in a school, right? To make your practice that transparent mm -hmm. uh, and to know that any, so how, and it goes back to leadership as part of that, uh, and certainly the partnership with Leap Innovations helped bring that culture shift. Absolutely. Uh, but how, like, say a little bit more, if you would, about how that felt and what that meant for teachers uh, mm -hmm. making that shift from perhaps privatized practice to very transparent. Sure, so uh, I think similarly to um, a few of our colleagues here, just talking about that idea of interest-based learning. I mean, the teachers who joined the, the, the LEAP team with us were all opt-ins. We opened it up to the whole school, mm -hmm. um, and so that early adopter mentality really, I think, of course, supports yeah. that idea that I'm already open and transparent, that I have a next step in my growth and my development. And, uh, and we, we use the word practice a lot, the teaching practice. It's a practice. It's not the Olympics with one final event. It is truly a long, <laughs> ongoing practice. Um, and, and certainly from the admin side, um, I make a lot of mistakes, and I, I'm very open about that, and I think that's important. Um, but that idea that um, the culture can start really small, and there can be really great little trickle effects happening, um, can, al can also then turn into a waterfall effect. And that truly is what we saw. Um, teachers that didn't opt in to our first cycle are now knocking on the doors of the teachers in the, the LEAP team saying, hey, I really want to come see your classroom today. I have a prep period for, you know, I have an extra 45 nice. minutes. And nice. Can I use my time right. um, to come see you? And that, to me, is very tangible evidence of what the yeah. work has done so far. No, oh, that's definitely representative of the shift. So thank you, Jessica. And as we know, all things always come back to Iowa. So, <laughs> we, all, we all know this. So. We are the heartland. Yeah, exactly. So, as you're hearing all these examples and, and reflect on your own, mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about your innovation and what kind of a difference it's made for your system. We actually do a, a multifaceted system because we, we have these high expectations for the way our teachers deliver content to our students to be uh, individualized, personalized, pay attention to what they need. We uh, expect them to get in contact with experts via social media but then we weren't expecting that of our own teachers. Mm -hmm. So we really had to stop and think about that shift. The other really nice thing that is kind of at the crux of, of what we're doing is the state of Iowa recently <coughs> started a teacher leadership and compensation program. And in the first year of that, we were able to apply. Uh, it was a very extensive process. And uh, only 33 schools were chosen. And our small district was one of the smallest to be chosen that first year. Mm -hmm. What this allowed us to do is to have a, a hierarchy, if you will, of different leadership roles. So we, um, being an instructional coach, was with uh, two other instructional coaches, and we worked together with our administration to together take a team approach to solving problems. Mm -hmm. So now this is a statewide initiative that um, everyone is now on board with in, in year three. But we've now been three years into mm -hmm. it and have just seen tremendous growth um, tremendous backing from our teachers and just the ability to continuously coach our teachers. Uh, so it's not like we'd go through professional development in any capacity and then we're done. We shut the door on that and let them move on, which is really some of the fault and some of the problem we're seeing in professional learning. Great, we're going to teach this all day long and good luck implementing and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, we just absolutely mm -hmm. saw that as a travesty. So we've solved that, that problem and, and continue to work on that problem. One of the things that we do is, as far as our faceted process is provide multiple different types of professional development for our teachers. And we use edweb.net um, as our kind of our mainstay. It is an absolutely free resource for educators and it has links to thousands of webinars on every topic under the sun. Um, things from special education topics, um, to you know, leading researchers, experts in the field all across the country and world. And it allows our departments of one mm -hmm. to
to find and seek out those experts, just like our students are expected to do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gives them that chance to reach beyond, far beyond classroom walls and make those connections with people who can make a real difference. And that's been pivotal for us. We use um, EdWeb actually in a number of different ways because not only is there the webinar component, but there are communities that you can host within, um, within EdWeb. There are several pre-existing ones that people can sign up for and, and you find like-minded colleagues that way in, in, a, in a wide variety of, of fields. But we also created our own school community, which has allowed us a, home, a digital home base, if you will, mm -hmm. for topics and conversations. And uh, to really springboard off of one of the questions um, from earlier about involving administration and people beyond, we invite our school board to take part in those conversations. Our, obviously, our administrators are taking part in that PD at the same time we are. Um, we even have professional learning that's involved our community. We have a top 20 uh, program that we're doing where the entire community has been um, informed on this kind of language. We as a, uh, school staff have been informed on this language, so there is a common thread in our entire community about building up our students from home to school. So it's really been great. And we've, we actually do it in a number of ways. We have individualized professional development days uh, where we actually have teachers, we use Google Slides actually to do this. Each teacher creates a slide of what they are learning, any links to pertinent things that they're going to be, you know, maybe going to on the web, uh, links to, to books, et cetera. And then we reflect on our EdWeb community about what it is we learned, how we plan to implement it, how will it would impact students, and then we respond to other people's comments. Nice. And it's, it's fabulous. The other thing, actually, I have to, I have to present on this, um, the day I get back, which should be fun, um, if, is- If the snow is gone. If this, well, yeah, <laughs> I, that, was, that was my agreement. Melt the snow, and then I'll come home. Got it. Um, but we have Rocket University, which is just another take on it. Just like we expect of our, in our classrooms, you never want to have the same type of professional learning mm -hmm. all the time. Right. As with anything, I don't care what the bells and whistles are, if it's overused, mm -hmm. it gets old quickly, and people lose interest. Mm -hmm. So another one of the things that we do is Rocket University, which is a, basically an in-house conference. So we use our own expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, we pull in people from the community. We have actually a, a fabulous hospital in town that has lots of people that are willing to come in and speak to different, um, whether physical or mental um, ailments that our students may be facing, giving us some ideas and, and pathways to help our, our students. We pull in people from all over the place, from our local area education agency, mm -hmm. to present. And then teachers get to select what they want to go to. Um, we have some feedback and some time for some collaboration, and then implementation time. And if you ask any teacher, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and the biggest complaint is there's no time to actually put this stuff into effect. Mm -hmm. And we build that in as a large part of our professional development. And, and really, EdWeb has allowed us to do that because even though I can walk down the hall and talk to you, being able to put things into print in our EdWeb community mm -hmm. allows us for just that deeper reflection and other people can see what those comments are instead of just nice. a one-on-one. -on -one. So, so you're mentioning EdWeb. I just uh -huh. want to ask about the other partners who might be in the room. Anyone from EdWeb in the room? All right, so we have any questions you have about EdWeb, uh, we can right here in the front row. And then IDO, IDO. Yeah, Mo Molly right here from the Teachers Guild. Okay, Teachers Guild from IDO right here in the front. Uh, and then we heard from Leap Innovation. Anyone from Leap Innovation in the room? Right in the back. So let's ask the audience, what kind of clarifying questions do you have? I'm, we'll just have time for a few. And I'm going to, by the way, to the panel, get ready to talk about impact. Like how do you know any sure. of what you just talked about made a difference? So we can take that clarifying question off the table. Any clarifying mm -hmm. questions for people in the audience that after hearing about these four programs that you just need to get a better picture? Yes. So reaching out to communities and hospitals, I'm thinking of the district that I work in, and we have a large homeless population, a large refugee population. Do they come in and talk about like social emotional needs of that population? Yes, absolutely. And so if you'd repeat the question. Yes. So she's basically asking if, you know, with the different types of populations um, in high need, do we have people in, in the community that are you know, from hospitals, et cetera, who come in and can speak to that? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we, while we don't have a large um, homeless population, we actually do have a lot of um, people that come, have come in from 
uh, Mexico, Guatemala, et cetera, and our population has changed exponentially in just the last few years. And with that, we even have students who, who just have a lot of just emotional needs. There are a lot of issues that our students are facing, um, and some from you know, very typical two-parent families, but they're still dealing with different types of trauma and um, other issues that really need to be dealt with first before you can expect them to start learning, you know, their ABCs and, and everything else if you don't heal them on the inside. So a lot of what we actually um, do is have people come in for things like Rocket University. We have a wonderful lady actually coming in on Friday to speak to us um, about trauma and how to use yoga as a method of helping them find release. So we're very, very excited about that. But yes, to answer your question, always, there's always somebody coming in to talk about something that will help us impact our students that way. We were actually planning to use a yoga exercise here, <laughs> but our time is limited, so we won't have the opportunity. Are there clarifying questions of any of the innovations that we've heard? Because we want to make sure that you've got some of those questions answered first. Yes. can speak to that. As far as our teacher leadership sorry, and compensation. If you the question as well. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, as far as making sure that we are you know, meeting the needs of, of everyone um, and making sure that our, our teachers are able to um, take this innovation and move it forward, some of the things that we are doing are um, with this teacher leadership and compensation um, program are able to have these conversations with teachers um, under the umbrella of what the state has provided for us, first of all. Um, so there is that. But we went to great lengths to explain that we as coaches are absolutely not in an evaluative position. We have no desire to do that whatsoever. We are an extra set of eyes and ears and hands to be that peer to bounce ideas off of. And so yes, there was a cultural um, shift a little bit. It's always difficult as a teacher, you are taught and trained. You've got your own little private world, and you even rarely get out of your classroom door sometimes. But to be able to welcome someone in and show your faults, or you know what you maybe deem as your faults, and be able to welcome somebody in, is is hard for anybody, I think, initially. But we were colleagues first. And that was the nice thing about our instructional coaches. We didn't hire instructional coaches from someone else, somewhere else. There's actually a, a rule with, uh, written within our plan that says you have to be in the district for three years before you can even apply for a coaching position. Yeah. So we're colleagues and friends first, which made it a lot easier. Um, then uh, to carry on with that, with our professional development then, we can see that that culture shift has happened because we are invited into their room almost immediately to say, you remember when we did this, could you help me get this in, in motion? So it's not like it ends there, we continue on and could have that conversation. Nice, and, and others may have a reaction to that very same question. Yeah, I, I think for us, you know, culture is at the core of everything, right? If you're gonna pretend that you have a pro professional learning experience that doesn't impact your culture in some way, you're gravely mistaken. And I think oftentimes when we make a, uh, an intervention of any type or support teachers in a particular way and we don't take into consideration the broader context, that's typically why things end up, you know, tending towards the mean, right? Like things don't change. Um, a great quote from a friend of mine um, was that uh, schools change innovation more than innovation changes school. Um, and that's because oftentimes when we're innovating and trying new things, we're really not thinking about that cultural context. So with us in the design thinking work, um, with the Teachers Guild, we are a very sort of corporate culture. We get things done. We run things like a ship. Um, and so this idea of having like, oh, design thinking where we're going to talk about failure openly and things like that was rather countercultural. Um, but it was something where we realized that um, kind of to, to the idea of how you build new cultures, you have to change the task that teachers are faced with. And for us, the task is no longer thinking about how do you do well on a test. It's how do we make sure that our children are prepared to be the problem solvers of tomorrow? And so when you change that task, it allows just the, everything has to sort of shift 
in order to reach that level. So yeah, we think about culture all the time, especially when you're thinking about teachers within a broader institution that has its own culture within a, a school or in a district. Um, and so we think about it at multiple layers in addition to the culture that students bring to the school um, and families in the community. So it's, it's really neat to think about that inter intersection. And I think we go wrong when we don't think about how that impacts it. Um, and, and I think our work with the Guild does a lot to make sure that you're explicitly addressing that as part of the work. No, I appreciate that. And I'm looking at our time. We have about 10 minutes left. And we want to talk about impact. And we want to talk about if, if a funder, if a, someone from your legislature, if someone came to you and said, how do you know that the investment you're making, the investment of time, dollars, whatever, mm -hmm. is really making a difference in terms of educator practice and results for kids mm -hmm. and the programs that you all describe? And Jessica, I'm going to start with you. Sure. What what evidence might you provide that your innovation is making a difference? Mm -hmm. uh, well, certainly the student impact. I mean, it's very clear that student performance is up. Um, so that's just a numerical, uh, very quantitative way to capture the impact of the adult learning on the student learning. Um, so I think that that's um, one that we could talk about and just kind of sit down with a sheet and go side by side and, and do that. But, but besides that, um, more so the thing that, that I think about is Angela Duckwork yesterday I talked about job satisfaction in her mm -hmm. keynote speech. And um, that's something that I have seen both informally and formally through um, quarterly reflections with our teachers, that they are significantly more satisfied in their work than our teachers who have not collaborated with LEAP. Um, and so that kind of, uh, tr you know, ripple effect of that idea that, you know, of course, at the end of the day, you want to be satisfied when you're at work. You want to come to work and feel excited and joyful and, and really motivated. And that intrinsic piece um, is something that is maybe hard to quantify, mm -hmm. um, but certainly it's easy to anecdotally share. And I think that's something that you see um, at the LEAP trainings. There's, I mean, to be totally transparent, we go on Saturdays. That's, that's a big ask for teachers who are already working a really, a really difficult long week. So the excitement and joy when we see teachers there on a Saturday morning excited to learn tells me a lot. Um, so I think as far as job satisfaction, ultimately that's had a huge culture shift, coming back to that initial question, and, and that culture is contagious, and it makes it exciting and enjoyable to want to be alongside for that journey. Nice. Two very important things to measure and obviously uh, great results there in Chicago. Crystal, what about you? What, what kind of impact would you speak to? Yeah, so as I think of this, we have numbers. We know that um, we've had over half of our teacher cohort engage in micro-credentials. We are um, at 62 micro-credentials earned in our district. And we're talking about 119 teachers here. We're a very small space. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that they're engaged. That's not quite enough to measure impact. Um, but beyond that, the credentials that they are engaging in are really focused on best practices, skills that we want our teachers to have. So we're looking at data-driven interventions is one of our foundational micro-credentials. We have a lot of teachers engaging in that space. That immediately transfers to the classroom. They're demonstrating that in classroom practice. Um, and so we have that. The other piece, though, I would say, it's just the, the conversations that are changing and the vocabulary that is changing in our district because of this engagement. So I have teachers who will say, um, oh, I, I got my feedback back from that micro-credential, and I'm not yet. I'm not yet proficient. Can you show me your evidence? What mm -hmm. did you do mm -hmm. to earn this? Because mm -hmm. I know you're there. You've got that skill. And those conversations for me carry more, more value than anything because the, the tide is changing, the vocabulary is changing in how we interact as teachers. Nice. No, again, so it goes back to the, the satisfaction and just mm -hmm. taking ownership of my craft yeah. as an educator becomes yeah. so important. Yep. I appreciate that. Babak, what would you uh, add as impact in Gwinnett? Sure, I mean, to, to, to sort of frame it out a little bit, um, to anyone who's a funder out there, Impact takes a long time, mm -hmm. right? Education is something that, like learning doesn't happen overnight. 
Um, and if you fundamentally want to change the trajectory of learners' knowledge and where they're going to end up, which is what I think all of us up here are focusing on, the trajectories for impact on like actual impact on student achievement beyond just like a blip on a test or things like that is like a very long term long term piece. Yeah. That said, with innovations, I think we need we need to be impatient for impact as well, right? Be patient mm -hmm. for scale, impatient for impact. Um, and that's, that's what we're looking at in Gwinnett County. Um, and with the Teachers Guild, what we've been able to really do is start looking at some uncommon indicators of, of impact, of shifts in culture, of shifts in practice. Um, and, and one of the, I'll just share a very quick story, is we have a, uh, our, our teachers who are involved go everything from a brand new first year teacher to people who've been in the system for 25 to 30 years. Um, and we had one of our veteran teachers, I believe a teacher of over 20 years, um, who, who came to, to me and said, um, this design thinking stuff has got me thinking completely differently mm -hmm. about my practice. Like I went in yesterday to, to deliver a lesson and I realized I need to look at my lessons differently. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an incredible shift to occur, especially for a veteran, where the, the guild's work isn't around telling mm -hmm. people, hey, you need to shift your practice because we, <laughs> we need you to change, which is how most PD gets done, <laughs> which is I think is very unlike what's going on up here. Um, but instead is really getting people to look and bring out themselves, re-examine just everything they mm -hmm. normally do with this new lens of design thinking. Um, and so for us, a lot of the early indicators have been around uh, shifts in teacher practice. Um, to, to the uh, point earlier, a lot of, a lot of teacher satisfaction pieces um, and a lot of principals saying, hey, this is really neat. It's not actually just about the ideas that they come out with, um, but my teachers feel process. empowered and they, they have this like new feel of leadership to them um, that they didn't before. And, and these are things that are harder to just wrap your, your mind around, but it's still very important. Yeah. Appreciate that. R Rachel, what impact? Well, I, I'd say with these things that the colleagues here have brought up, you know, I'm, we're right along there. You know, there's data, you talk to your teachers, you, you look at the culture shift and things like that. But for us, I really think that the biggest facet for me is the community and the teachers having this common ground where we all have the same goal to help raise our kids and raise them right. And it's not an us and them, it's a we. Um, and that has been enormous. Plus the fact that, you know, we're, we, I always just refer to us as tiny but mighty because <laughs> the, some of the things that we are doing are very, very innovative and we have people coming in from all over to see what we're doing. Um, and because it's April and there's another snowstorm, um, <laughs> one of the very interesting things that we've actually done for professional development is just constantly listen to our teachers. And last year, um, about this time, we had, actually a little earlier, um, we had a very, very bad snowstorm on a day where we were supposed to have some professional learning. So a colleague and I built it online and we used EdWeb as our what's one of our platforms. Nice. And we used Nearpod, et cetera, and apps smashed lots of different things together, and we delivered it mm -hmm. to them in their homes. Wow. Um, and then to have genuine excitement, teachers posting on you know Instagram and Twitter with pictures of themselves sitting there with their <laughs> cup of coffee, going, "This is awesome." That's I mean, smart. that's powerful because that's they're impact. excited about it. Yeah. The engagement was able to still be measured. Mm -hmm. We could still see all the data that we needed to see about what they were doing with their day. But the conversations were great. And for the teachers to know that we listened to them and we made it happen um, mm -hmm. is incredibly empowering um, for all of us. It was very, very uplifting. And it's, it's still just a, a really great thing that, first of all, we hope we can continue to do because you know, our, our weather is less than stellar right now. So it's really great to be able to have some options. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And again, things that are hard to quantify, but it's extremely important. Right. And as we close, you know, I'll reflect on my days as a principal. I remember at the end of the school, any former principals in the audience or current principals? So you know that time of year where you're listing uh, who, which class the children will go into the following year? Uh, and parents will come to my door and saying, I want my child in Mr. So-and-so's class or Mr. So-and-so's class. And what I would typically do is, and uh, don't judge me for this, but um, <laughs> at the end of the school year or at the beginning of the next year, about a week out, we post on the, on the window of the school, here's your classroom, your child's teacher. 
It will be Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so. And I will literally put that on the door and walk out to the car and drive away because I would know, <laughs> because I would know that people will come and say, but I wanted my child in so-and-so's class. <laughs> the reality is, if we do professional learning right, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. It doesn't right. matter because every teacher will have access to effective <clears throat> learning because it's an equity issue. Every child should have access to the best mm -hmm. teacher. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing some of the things that you're describing up here, that's something that's gonna happen at scale. It's not gonna be, let me take you to that one room where things are going well. It's gonna be across, mm -hmm. across the school. So we thank you all for coming in here and, and hearing some great approaches to professional learning. I'm hoping that you all can help me thank our panel for all that they shared this morning.